بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمد الله ونصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد First of all, I would like to thank everyone for taking out your time I understand uh, it's a good mixed crowd There's many people coming as well uh, We have parents from our madrasa which I'll talk about a bit as well um, We have many um, youngsters from Walthamstow many people from outside Walthamstow some from outside London as well so everyone is coming for a particular reason for their own learning. Uh, firstly, I wanted to just get the ground rules out of the way. So first of all, fire exits, if you just look around, they're clearly uh, labelled. So they're labelled around uh, the hall as well. And as soon as you go outside the hall, they're all clearly labelled. Okay? Um, also, prayer space, there's prayer space outside. Someone who already prayed before, if you want to pray mid-lecture or after, that's also there. Uh, and as you all know, there's food and snacks outside, so please do indulge. Um, one important thing I wanted to mention that we want our lecture and the Q&A session to be finished by 9 o'clock. Um, if you have some questions afterwards uh, that you want to ask the speakers or myself, you're welcome to do that. We need to be out of the building by 9.45. Um, that's included out the gates and stuff, so if we can just um, keep that in mind. Um, before going on, I wanted to also talk about the Q&A session and how we're going to deal with that. So, we will be taking questions from the audience, okay, so verbal questions, but we'll also take written um, questions as well. So, if you've got your own pen and paper, that's fine. If you haven't, okay, before the lecture starts, there's um, some sticky notes there, there's pens there as well. You're more than welcome to help yourself. And <coughs> after that, um, you can just get them across, pass over to the Mufti Hilal. Can you stand up for uh, a few seconds? The Mufti Hilal is there, we'll pass them on to Dr. Duba. We will introduce him in a minute. Um, the thing about uh, Q&A, we will have two uh, types of Q&A. First of all, we will have a direct Q&A after each lecture. So after the first lecture, there will be about 15 minutes Q&A. After the second lecture, there will be about 20 to 15 to 25 minutes. Following that, right at the end, depending on how much time left, as we, I mean, if, they, if we finished both by you know, quarter to nine, that means we'll have 15 minutes extra of Q&A for both speakers. Okay? So that can be a bit more of an engaged kind of discussion that we could have. Um, now, um, I wrote this down, I've emailed everyone as well. Uh, due to the you know, enormity of the topic, we request that the audience keep to the questions and make sure that they're restricted to the lectures. Okay? And if there is a question requiring, requiring an in-depth response, we've asked the lecturers to give like a brief summary. And then we will uh, make a list of um, uh, topics that we will have in the future. Okay? And there's a few more that I will be talking about just before I finish the intro. So if there is a topic that requires a lot of information, okay, a lot of in-depth information, we've asked our speakers to kind of give a summary, and then we will make a note of the type of topics <coughs> that we want to have in the future, inshallah. So it's not that we're trying to avoid it, it's just that because we have a very, you know, very limited amount of time, therefore we're trying to engage with that properly. Now, before we begin, uh, there were questions coming about, you know, what is Fatima Elizabeth Academy? And as a madrasa, why do we facilitate, uh, or why are we having such a conference and having such lectures? So, oops, let me turn that off. Okay. Right, so, first of all, we've only been around since uh, 2015, okay? And uh, 2014, December. And it's only been about four years. And so, we're fairly new. And when I say that we're a madrasa, I mean, madrasa can mean many things. So, what I mean by madrasa in our context is, we're basically, we facilitate Islamic education, and Quran, and the dream, and things like that, but in a fun and engaging way for children, age from four all the way up to 16. Okay? And uh, so we are basically an after-school madrasa. We're not a Darul Ulum or anything like that. Um, so that's us, and we've named our madrasa Fatima Elizabeth after one of the very first uh, converts during the Victorian period. And she went through a lot of struggle, a lot of strife, and she accepted Islam. During the Victorian era, she went through a lot of sacrifices. So therefore, there were a few other things that we wanted to, you know, you know, bring her name to life. And we've taken a few things from her life and embedded them in our philosophy. Now, one of the things about our madrasa that I want to talk about very briefly is the philosophy. That we keep at the fore of our philosophy the transformation of hearts and minds. 
So at times we feel that when we look at mainstream education, it's the focus on minds, okay? Or to be precise, it's more about how to pass your exams, okay, and how to take tests. Um, however, we wanted to focus on both, okay? The understanding, the mind, but uh, the, sorry, the heart, the spiritual aspect, but at the same time, the mind. But if, if your mind is confused, okay, if your mind cannot understand certain realities, then that will have an impact on your spirituality. So our philosophy as a madrasa, okay, I say we, we are a madrasa which specializes in facilitating uh, the cultural, experiential, conscientious, critical, and creative growth of children through to their later teens by means of a holistic pedagogy infused with the synthesizing of traditional and contemporary ideas in order for them to have a well-rounded Islamic worldview. Now, as part of that, we feel and we felt that the lives that our, the teenagers that come to our madrasa are living, there's a lot of questions that they, they begin to ask. There's certain experiences that they go through, and again, they begin to question their faith. We as a madrasa, we believe that questioning, having doubts, is pretty much part of your faith. There was a companion who came to Prophet Sallallahu and he says, you know, Messenger of Allah, I have doubts. And to the nearest you know, effect, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that that is the essence of faith. Because Shaytan, we believe, is like a, like a thief. Okay? But he is a thief of our faith and our iman. Um, if there's a thief outside and he's got two rooms to choose from, he's only got five minutes, and he looks through the letterbox, and he sees through one, one of the letterbox, there's, you know, there's a smart TV, there's a, so there's a good thing, there's only luxury, so many things he can pick at. He looks through the other letterbox and there's hardly anything there. The carpet's torn, the wallpaper's you know, falling apart. Which one will he choose? The one where he can take from. Okay? Similarly, with Shaitan, he would attack those hearts where there is faith. Now, one of the means would be through these doubts. So, this lecture that we're having, we've already had a lecture before this, which Sheikh Uthman will talk about. It was on evolution and Islam. We are going to revisit this topic more broadly Inshallah, in Germany, which I'll talk about as well. So, why as a madrasa do we hold lectures in science? There's many reasons. However, one crucial reason is the growing gap between the deeper understanding of science and topics like evolution, as an example, on grassroots level, and what is actually being discussed on academic levels. So, the idea of you know a lecture like this and a conference like this would be to facilitate the bridging of that gap between what's actually been spoken about and understood. On, you know, uh, about science and evolution and grassroots, and then what's actually happening in uh, uh, academic circles, and how to bridge that gap. Um, the purpose is also to start discussions on such topics that need to be considered uh, taboo. The reasoning for that is to open up discussions for those whose faith may be challenged. Okay? So the idea is some of you as parents may be coming today because your teenagers are having questions, they're having doubts, and that's absolutely fine. There are answers. And there's ways around things, you know. There's always been questions for the past 1400 years, and that discourse takes place. So that's one of the things that we're here. Now this fits in with the philosophy of our of our madrasa, because uh, we just don't know, not only cater for the fiqh of students, you know, their fiqh, not only for the spiritual aspect, but also their minds and their questions that they go through in uh, their daily lives today. And I'm going to round off now and finish off. Um, before I introduce Kuba, uh, <coughs> who will be uh, chairing today's session, chairing the Q&A, I just wanted to tell you in advance about two events that are taking place, okay? so you can get them from your diaries. They, uh, more detailed information will be out over the next one or two weeks, so if you want more information about that, please do follow us on Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter, and um, you know, every other social media outlet that we have. Um, the, so, we're going to have a follow-on to this um, lecture in January. We haven't fixed the dates yet, but it will be the first week of January. And the topic and the conference will be on evolution, science and Islam. Where we'll have the um, same speakers again, inshallah, and also potentially one more speaker. <coughs> and they will go more broadly into the topic of evolution. Now, as a madrasa, we uh, don't hold any particular view ourselves. 
Okay? But what we do want to do, as I mentioned before, is to facilitate for uh, academics to come, uh, and Muslim academics, and show us all the views out there, let us understand what they are, and then make our own decisions. So we're not kind of, uh, we're not trying to brainwash them. For us, it's all about facilitating this, and for you to make the decision. So that's the first thing for January. The second uh, thing which is going to be more, um, uh, more longer, more extensive, and that's during the Easter, there are two the weeks of holiday in Easter. We're thinking of a five day extensive course. We change some of the details. Five days, where we'll do like about four hours each day. We're trying to do like a 10 week module within those five days. Yeah. Is that how it's going to get? Yeah. Okay. And um, the paper and it's going to be on the philosophy of science and religion. And let me just tell you some of the modules that will be taught during that by Professor Shuey, who's also here with us today. Introduction to philosophy of science and religion, okay. relating science and religion, logic, because of deductive, inductive logic, uh, science and pseudoscience, the demarcation problem, uh, the epistemology of science, uh, physics and theology, so that can kind of bring Islam into this, evolution and theology, natural theology, uh, theology of nature, and then finally the last session <coughs> on Islam and science. So, um, we will put out more details for that. Um, do sign up straight away. There's only going to be about 50 spaces for that, so it will be like lecture kind of space. However, there's going to be a lot of discourse discussion on that. Okay, so keep those two events for the future, inshallah. Uh, I want to I was going to quickly summarize both uh, lectures, but I think there's uh, not much time left, so we'll allow them to do that. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Tuba to make her way uh, to the front, inshallah, and she will introduce. Uh, the lecture is to us and also uh, take the Q&A as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, Jazakallah and Jazakallah for asking me to chair this event. Um, I can't stress how important having you know, studied uh, the social sciences at a senior level for my uh, PhD was in epidemiology and public health. And one of the things that we found was that it was very, very rare for someone to have a religion, let alone be of a specific religion. But there's, there seems to be, uh, among a lot of circles, a very fine, a, sort of a very deep line which divides those who believe in the sciences versus those who believe in religion. Uh, others will argue that it's a false dichotomy and the two can exist in the same space. So it's really, really important for us to have these sorts of conversations where there's a space to facilitate where the two can come together and, and how what that fusion looks like. Uh, so, so the first thing for today is Sheikh Usman Ali. And he's a graduate from Durham uh, So he graduated from Durham in London in 2005. Uh, he then went on to study biomedical sciences and obtained an MSc in Ecology at the University of Westminster. So currently, mashallah, he is lecturing in the biomedical sciences at the University of Portsmouth, uh, where he is also um, completing his PhD. So let's see if I get this right on his PhD topic. So he focuses on hematological solutions to intensive care medicine in collaboration with the NHS. And that's what forms uh, part of the PhD. Uh, so what we're doing here today and his interests are the multiple explanations in Darwinian evolution, the scientific debate over the intelligent design theory, the Islamic concept of humanness between <coughs> science and or essentialist philosophy. philosophy. He also has interests in the history and philosophy of science with a focus on biological evolution, Islam and atheism, and interaction between scientific and religious discourse um, in the 21st century. And most importantly, above all, uh, I think it's really important as Sadh Mood also made uh, asked me to be uh, very clear in mentioning that he's uh Sheikh Smiley is a member of the esteemed disciple club. Uh, which is a bicycle club that takes place uh, on Saturday at Fatima with Kate's Academy. And I think that trumps all of his uh, achievements today. All right, over to you, Shik.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First and foremost, I would like to thank Fatima Elizabeth Cates Academy for inviting me to lecture on this topic of Islam and science. As uh, Sheikh has mentioned, this is my second lecture. The first lecture is available on YouTube. You can check that under Fatima Elizabeth Cates Academy uh, YouTube channel, also under my channel, which is Uthman Ali Lofer. So that lecture was critiquing a scientific theory using science. Whereas today's lecture, inshallah, which I think is a very important topic, and it's a related topic, but this time, inshallah, I'll be talking at the interface between Islam and science. Whereas the previous lecture was more to do with a scientific topic where Islam was not brought into the uh, subject matter. So I think this is a unique opportunity for myself and for all of us to critically engage the theme of today's conference, which is Islam, Atheism, and Science. Now, you may think that a uh, professor's lecture, which is on Islam and uh, Atheism, and my lecture, which is on Islam and Science, are disconnected and two isolated themes. But let me tell you that that would be a, a wrong assumption. What with the lecture the professor is doing is Islam's relationship with an ideology which is atheism. And the lecture I'm doing is Islam's relationship with a methodology, which is science. Now, the reason why I believe these are very, very intrinsically connected subjects is because the atheists of, of our time, they are using science as their method, method, uh, 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 epistemic justification for their case. So if we to understand Islam and uh, atheism, then we ought to also understand Islam's relationship with science because that's the methodology atheists use to justify the case. So that's my uh, uh, beginning. Now, I want to just go through the overview of my lecture, which I won't be able to cover today because of very restricted time. But as Chef mentioned, that we will be doing this over a series of uh, lectures. So some of these topics will come in the next part of my lecture. So I might be able to cover just the first part, inshallah. Now, the lecture will begin with Islamic worldview and classification of sciences. <coughs> and next, uh, this will cover basic assumptions of Islamic empirical science, Islamic system of classifying sciences, and problems of Eurocentric worldview and Islamic reframing. Now, I think this is very important that this part that I initially, when I designed this lecture, I decided to put this at the end and talk about the history and philosophy of science so that uh, it, 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 you can understand how scientists uh, do science uh, and what their philosophical assumptions are. But then I think to myself that if we don't understand our own paradigm, then what we'll end up uh, in that problem where we understand what scientists are doing, but we don't understand what our narrative should be. So that's my first part of the lecture. Next, I will provide a historical overview of scientific activity with a particular focus on Islamic and Eurocentric worldviews. And in this part, I will show that empirical science developed during the Islamic Golden Age. And it was subsequently secularized by the Europeans. And this was done during the Age of Enlightenment and after the Age of Enlightenment during the positivism and the post-positivism era. Uh, post-positivism actually moved away from this type of narrative, but during the positivist era. So that's what the second part of the lecture will be, and the third part of the lecture will be on methodology of modern science. And in this part, I will move on to critiquing the scientific methodology that uh, underpins contemporary accounts of science. And I will show that contemporary scientific methodology is not fixed, and science has no timeless intrinsic rules. Now, that doesn't mean that science has no laws of change. It means that science itself has no intrinsic method which is fixed. So over time, these methods change. And there, there is no rule that precludes metaphysical discourse in science. So in the secularized atheist worldview, or atheistic or agnostic type worldview, the, the science has got this metaphysical uh, protective belt. And in the Islamic worldview, Islam will also have, uh, science will also have a protective belt of its own. So that type of discourse is not precluded in the 
uh, scientific uh, 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 methodology. Now, these are some of my basic assumptions of science when speaking from the Islamic worldview. Now, when we talk about science, science is not monopolized to any uh, worldview, neither agnosticism, neither atheism, neither Islam. However, science arose from within the Islamic tradition. So science was pioneered, the method of science was pioneered by the Muslims. So we were the first civilization to think empirically and to apply the empirical method into, our, into uh, uh, the, the education system. So the basic assumptions I have about science and its worldview is firstly, science is a domain of study that explains habitual relationships amongst physical phenomena. Now, my, uh, I've italicized the word habitual for, uh, uh, for, uh, for a reason, and that reason is that the relationship between cause and effect, which is what scientists study. So when scientists do experiments, they study the relationship between cause and effect. That relationship between the cause and effect is not necessary. And this is what Imam al-Ghazali stated in his uh, work called Tahafut al-Falasifa about a thousand years ago and set the Islamic worldview straight. And he states in his chapter 17 of Tahafut al-Falasifa الاقتران بين ما يعتقد في العادة سببا وما يعتقد مسببا ليس ضروريا عندنا. So he is saying that the connection between what is habitually believed to be the cause and what is habitually believed to be the effect is not necessary according to us. Now what this means is that there is no causal closure in the physical world. And this is the way the philosophers of science use these terminologies. They will tell you that between the cause and effect, the relationship is necessary. Therefore, when scientists study this relationship, they must be, whatever conclusions they draw from that, must violate or, or must contradict any miraculous occurrences. So this is why it's very important to understand this very fundamental point. So the, our understanding is that the causation has two levels, primary and secondary. Now this is talking about the primary where Allah SWT intervenes and he is not violating the natural laws. This is not the violation of the natural laws, this is intervening in the irregularities between the cause and effect when Allah SWT chooses to do so. However, when it comes to defining science, so you may think to yourself that if that's the case and miracles can, uh, are able to happen, then how can we do science in a meaningful way? Because it means that scientists will uh, perform an experiment in their laboratory and then they will be uh, having the assumption that there might be a miracle that might happen and therefore they cannot perform meaningful science. That assumption will be incorrect. The reason is because the way we define science is that science is organized body of knowledge secured through systematic investigation of Sunnah Firqan, Allah's Sunnah in the universe. And what is Allah's Sunnah? Allah's Sunnah is regularity in the universe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by default does not intervene in the universe unless, there, uh, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to do so and that's where we, uh, we, we assume the miracle. And that's not the default. The default is that there will always be a regularity in, within the universe. So the aim of Muslim scientists would be to learn as much as possible about the laws of uh, nature in order to uh, exploit the causal relationship and in order to extend to humanity uh, 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 science and technology that we uh, benefit from in our time. Now the question is, is there any direct contradiction between Islam and empirical sciences? Now I've taken this picture from uh, uh, Molana uh, Hamid's website, so you can ask him where it came from. But this is an author from Ottoman Empire. His name is Tash Kubrizada. Now, Tash Kubrizada was a Qadi of Istanbul from the 16th century. And he classified and uh, gave levels of existence, classified different sciences and gave levels of existence. Now, there's a reason why I'm mentioning this in today, uh, today's lecture, is because this will all relate to the question of Islam and science. How do Muslims understand the relationship? They classified sciences in a different way. 
So this he wrote a book called Miftah al-Sa'ada wa Misbah al-Siyad wa Misbah al-Siyad fi Mawdu'at al-Ulum. Now this is a book that's written on different levels of existence and classification of different sciences. So Taj Kubrizada moves from epistemology, which is theories of knowing, to, uh, uh, to ontology, which is different <coughs> levels of existence. And the book is a very important book for uh, stu students who want to understand the conditions of being a student and teachers who want to understand the duties and responsibilities of teachers towards their <coughs> students. So what Taj Kubrizada does, he gives us a very basic uh, distinction between two different type domains uh, of knowledge, and they are alam al shahada and alam al ghayb. Alam al shahada is the external perceptual world that we get to perceive through our uh, our senses, our, our faculties, which is our uh, hawas, which is uh, the, uh, the the five senses as well as our intellectual senses, and also the alam al ghayb, which is our intellectual faculties, uh, sorry, Arnold which is the invisible world, uh, which is the separate domain of study. Now what he does, he divides these, and then he explains knowledge according to these two domains of study. So he says the Arnold Shahada is attained, the knowledge related to Arnold Shahada is attained through Edmund Prosuri, which is the knowledge acquired through reflection. And he calls it Tariq al nazar path of reflection. Now, reflection could be both aqli as well as naqli. And then he goes on to talk about the alam al ghayb which is the uh, which is acquired through ilm al huduri which is uh, uh, a path of dhawq, experience. And he calls this tariq al tasfir, a path of purification. And then what he does is he goes into different levels of existence. So he categorizes existence to four levels. And he calls these levels kitabi, ibarati, dhani, and ayni. So existence is either in writing, which is figurative existence, in utterance, in mind, and in the physical external world, in <coughs> real external existence. Now, in Islamic epistemology, existence uh, is in the, in the outer world, there's existence of khariji, which is the real existence. And there's existence in a mind which is categorized into two categories, which is haqiqi and ghayr haqiqi, wahmi. So there are different levels of existence. And he then connects this to different sciences. Now these are four, the four existences which I just told you. Here he has three levels. So he's got the um, kitabi, ibarati, and dahmi. At the level of kitabi, he calls these sciences wujud majazi, figurative sciences. So these sciences include uh, utensils of writing, rules, calligraphy, orders of alphabet, and so forth. Then the second level of existence, that's the lowest, lowest level. He moves on to the second level of existence, and these are wujud al fawi And these are sciences to do with words, so semantical sciences, semantic derivation of words, grammar, and so forth. And then he moves on to the third level, which is wujud dahni. Now these are sciences of mind, the philosophical sciences, philosophy of mind, which we call in our contemporary times. And these include logic, disputation, apologetics, uh, polemics, and so forth. And again, I mentioned that there's a khilaf, there's a disagreement amongst ulama whether this is real external existence or not. Uh, there are some ulama who would say that this is an external existence, and <coughs> others would say this is wahmi, this is just uh, an illusion. Now, the Fourth level of existence, which is what I'm interested in for today's lecture, which is Islam and science. He categorizes this and he explains this as wujud ayni. These are sciences of external existence or sciences of reality. Because the Muslims, they adhere to correspondence theory to reality, whereas the West has moved away from the correspondence theory to reality to coherence theory of reality during and after the age of enlightenment. So Muslims believe there is an external real world that exists in reality. And under that uh, domain, they categorize sciences, four trees of sciences. Now, with the first science, which is known as Ilm al-Shari, which is the revealed sciences, these sciences have two trees under that. And then you have Ilm al-Hikmi, which is philosophical sciences, which also has two trees. 
Now moving to the Shari sciences, these are revealed sciences which has first tree, which is tree number four, known as Ilm al Islami, and these include Ulum al Sharia, Quran and Sunnah, or it's uh, this uh, tertiary sources like uh, 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 Ijma and uh, 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 Ijma and Qiyas. Uh, uh, and under that will come also those uh, sciences which deal with Aqli paradigm, so Aql to defend Naqal, such as Ilm al Kalam, which is a defensive mechanism with, with, within the Muslim <coughs> sciences. And then comes the Ilm al Tasawwuf, which is the sciences that acknowledge duality of human beings. So there's a physical realm known as Ajsam al uh, Ajsam, and there is a spiritual realm which is known as Alam al Malakut. So, after this, now this is the point that really matches to the whole theme of to my lecture. He then divides the Ilm al Hikmi, which is the philosophical sciences, into two broad categories, and he calls them Hikma al and Hikma al So, this is tree six and tree seven. <coughs> now, Hikma al I've highlighted green because they are the natural sciences. What we call in our contemporary time natural sciences is what Taj Kudru Zada is calling Hikma uh, uh, al Now we can see that this, these sciences are the sciences of reality and they come within the classification systems of Muslims. And under that he has Hikma al which are the political sciences, ethics, economics, leadership, uh, governance, siyasa and so forth. Now, the reason why this is important, this classification system, is because it shows us that these sciences, the natural sciences, are not in any direct conflict with the uh, religious sciences. They form part of the sciences that deal with reality. So Muslims never demarcated between the natural sciences and the religious sciences with any authoritative demarcating rule other than putting the uh, revealed sciences above the natural sciences, just like uh, the 20th century philosopher of science, Imre Lakatos, would have you believe that the nat natural sciences has a core, uh, uh, it has a core, hard core and a protective belt around it. That protective belt is the sciences other than the revealed sciences. So whenever there is any falsification within sciences, those falsifications are true. To falsify any science will be attacking the uh, protective belt, not the core, uh, core of those sciences. So this will be exactly the case with the religious sciences. <clears throat> now here is the methodological framework which, uh, com which is common to all of these uh, disciplines which I've just pointed out. Now these seven trees which I've just shown you, they all converge onto Tawhidic universalism. Now this is a concept of which is the bedrock of Islamic epistemology and this in all sciences, whether inductive, deductive, empirical or rational, kitabi, ibawati, dhani, aini, whichever science you deal with, all of these sciences converge upon the Tawhidic universalism. Now this is a, uh, uh, so you may think that Tawhid is actually a, a concept within Aqidah. And you'll be right in thinking that. Now, Tawhid is a concept within Aqidah, and I'm not talking about Tawhidic universalism as an ontological concept. I'm talking about Tawhidic universalism as an epistemological concept, a theory of knowing. <coughs> All sciences are embraced under this, this uh, paradigm of integrating, which is Tawhidic universalism. So what we should be doing when we discuss the topic of Islam and science is we should be trying to recast our contemporary knowledge, which is empirical sciences, upon the Islamic methodological heritage, which is Tawhidic universalism. Because Muslims never demarcated sciences where the, uh, the trajectory of science moves away from that unified truth. So our truth is unified, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unity, knowledge should be unified. If science is a knowledge-seeking activity, Knowledge is a truth-seeking activity. Therefore, science is a truth-seeking activity. So science should be trajected towards that truth, that unified truth. And that unified truth, epistemologically, is the Tawhidic universalism which I am talking about. So everything converges onto that. Now, you might be thinking that why should uh, this paradigm be taken over any other paradigm? 
And I would respond by saying that Western culture, Western education system has not been able to provide us with an integrating system. And it's all disintegrated. So sciences are being separated. So we are being told under the Eurocentric worldview, which is secularized, that natural science has nothing to do with religion. Therefore, you religious folks, do your religious um, activities within your uh, religious domain and don't have anything to do with the natural sciences. But this is preposterous and absolutely false because history and philosophy of science teaches us that science came, took birth in a theological context and not just that it took birth in a theological context, science was also being practiced harmoniously with, between uh, between the, uh, at the interface between uh, religion and science. There was no conflict. Conflict is a very recent phenomenon. Now, moving on, I will just give you some quotes to justify what I'm saying. This is actually a theory which is consensus of Muslim contemporary intellectual discourse on epistemology. On capital, how do we know what we know? And this is what epistemology is all about. How do we then uh, group sciences? And in this field, this is Professor Sayyid Hussein Nasser in his work on Islam and the problem of modern science. He echoes the same message that I am putting in front of you, which is Tawhidic universalism. And he says that um, Muslims must seek to create their own science by incorporating what is positive in modern science to a worldview where God reigns supreme. Now, what is that worldview where God reigns supreme? Tawhidic universalism, where all the signs converge to, and tra uh, are trajected towards that truth, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot eliminate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the equation. That would be totally uh, alien to our worldview. <coughs> Here we have a well-known Muslim philosopher, of, uh, and he is a very competent scholar in traditional science as well as philosophy and metaphysics, known as Sayyid Nuqayb uh, uh, al-Aqqas. And he is the founder of a concept known, uh, co-founder of the concept known as Islamization of knowledge. Now let me tell you one thing. When I say Islamization of knowledge, you may think that <coughs> knowledge is agnostic with regards to any religious uh, commitment. So why Islamization? Why a process-driven uh, activity going on with regards to religious, uh, religion and science interface? Well, let me tell you something. Science and religion work together and the reason why we're having to Islamize the concept is because Eurocentric worldview has segregated between the Islamic and the, um, uh, the uh, empirical sciences and made a demarcation. So we need to then make an activity, create an activity which tries to bring back that methodology, which is that Islam and science were not in any conflict, methodologically speaking. Now, worldviews will be in conflict, by the way. So our metaphysics, which I've shown in the beginning, uh, which does not take the causal relationship, uh, does not take a necessary uh, premise in the causal relationship, will be in direct conflict with the Eurocentric world where that relationship has been categorized as a necessary, necessary relationship. Of course, that would be different, but that's a metaphysical worldview. It's not the, uh, it's not science, empirical science, because empirically you cannot test the idea. So, Nukhid al Atas, he he proposes the Islamization of knowledge, and he talks about isolation infusion concept. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, knowledge must be imbued with Islamic elements and key concepts and, and concept after the foreign elements and key concepts have been isolated from every branch. So you isolate the secular, secular concepts from the empirical science, which are metaphysical concepts, not core elements of uh, empirical science, and you reinfuse our methodological heritage and our principles, our values, our ethics, our metaphysical worldview, then there is no conflict. So conflict is with that metaphysical uh, worldview in the European context. You take that away and you infuse the Islamic worldview, there, should not, there shouldn't be a conflict. Now here we have a uh, Mufti Taqi Uthmani, who served as a judge on the federal Sharia court in Pakistan and is one of the prominent scholars with the title of Sheikh al-Islam. He wrote an article on the structure of our education system and he makes the same complaint as Sayyid Abbas as, and uh, Hussein Nasser has been. And he says that Pakistan needs a single and integrated education platform. Now that's 
that's uh, uh, mimicking exactly what Wahidic universalism is all about. Our education system should include teachings of all worldly and divine aspects. So there shouldn't be an education system where you go to madrasa and you've got nothing to do with empirical sciences. Madrasa should be dealing with this. <coughs> Likewise, our universities, our secular domain, should not be secularized with the Euro Eurocentric um, uh, belt of metaphysics. It should also be dealing with the Islamic <coughs> concepts. So it should be integrated. Uh, so and then, and what is a single and integrated platform that Mufti Tafmuthman is talking about? This is the Tawhid universalism that I'm talking about. Now, here we have Iqbal, is known as al Iqbal, the poet of Mashrik. So, so he talks about empirical science, and the reason why I brought this quote up is to show that um, our universal, um, universal epistemology should include empirical sciences because empirical sciences are not foreign to our culture and our religion. And he says, I believe that empirical science association with the visible is an indispensable stage in the life of contemplation. So empirical sciences cannot be excluded from our religion because it is our innate activity. We, we, Quran has a general empirical attitude. In a lot of verses in the Quran, Allah SWT invokes mankind to contemplate and to experience the world. Now, if we're going to remove that, we've removed a significant part of our Quranic paradigm from Islam. So, empirical sciences is intrinsic to Islam, and we should use uh, its indispensable stage in Muslim contemplation. Now, I'll just we, I'll, I'll conclude on this, inshallah. So, I want to now just point out the problems of Eurocentric worldview. Now, the empirical methodology as I've just mentioned, is innately good. So there is no problem between Islam and science when it comes to the core aspects and the, the basic elements of empirical methodology. The problems lie in the manner and context of its use, which, the Euro, Euro, which, is, which is what I call Eurocentric worldview. Now, the Eurocentric worldview has introduced several problems into, uh, into empirical sciences. Firstly, Bias due to a priori assumptions. Now, what I mean by that, and I'll explain. A priori assumptions, I mean that without any empirically grounded rules, they've introduced into empirical sciences rules that you must follow, and if you are to follow those rules, then naturally you will preclude uh, a, a supernatural or metaphysical discourses within science. Now, supernatural uh, metaphysical discourse has bearing on scientific questions. When scientists do science, they do science at three different levels. One, there are accepted theories. Secondly, there are theories which they use, like engineers, they use theories to make bridges, for example. So these are theories they use. And there's a third level, which is theories they pursue. The theories they pursue have bearing on supernatural metaphysical questions that cannot be excluded from scientific activity. So they have an a priori commitment to, towards methodological naturalism, which is a rule that science is methodologically restricted to naturalism, which is uh, physical phenomena. And if that is the case, then how do we justify this methodological naturalism rule in science? There are two different categories of methodological naturalism. One is the that science has an intrinsic property of naturalism, I, uh, methodological naturalism, this intrinsic rule of science. The second category is that science is pragmatically methodologically naturalistic, but the history and philosophy of science has taught us that science cannot keep any single, uh, to any single method, therefore these methods will change in due course. And that's the method Muslims should be adopting. And the reason why I say that is because if we adopt an intrinsic rule to be methodologically naturalistic, then we fall into this kind of very difficult situation that we are not allowed to have any uh, discourses at the interface between Islam and science, between metaphysics and physics, uh, that, uh, that have bearing on, uh, uh, bearing on the questions of life, the questions of our, our existence, because we've set a rule that creates barrier between us and them. Now that's the first Eurocentric world view that's very problematic for us. 
So they have an a priori commitment to methodological naturalism, which and they introduce into the scientific method these rules. And guess what? These rules were took birth in a post-Darwinian world. So before Darwin, methodological naturalism, if you read the history, such a rule didn't exist in Ibn Haytham's time. Such a rule didn't exist in Ibn Shatir's time. Muslim scientists have been doing science for centuries without having these rules put there to prevent them to uh, ask questions which are the uh, interface between science and religion because there are rules preventing them from doing that. Such a thing never happened. This is a modern phenomenon and it's a phenomenon to facilitate secularization of our education system. And to some extent, I must admit that they've been very successful in doing this is because many Muslims have jumped onto the bandwagon and they have seen this dualism between our knowledge that, yeah, it's fine, science is different, religion. You religious folks have nothing to do with science, therefore stick to your religion, let us do our science. But this is inter it's integrated, it's connected between science and religion has no barriers between it. Now, second thing, uh, ascension, only assertion that only empirical knowledge is valid. So this is a Eurocentric problem as well. Now, in the positivism time, they, have I gone over time? No, no, five minutes. Five minutes, okay, I'd like to finish off that. In the, um, uh, in the positivism, uh, the era of, uh, there was a philosophical movement in the 19th century which was known as the New Religion of Humanity. So it was dubbed as New Religion of Humanity. And this movement was called uh, positivism. And their aim was to define science in such a way that only log mathematically grounded logic and empirical science can be considered meaningful uh, knowledge and everything else becomes meaningless. So theology becomes meaningless, ethics becomes meaningless, uh, likewise metaphysics becomes meaningless. But what they did actually is they tried to uh, get rid of metaphysics, but <coughs> metaphysics came through back root into back into science <coughs> during the uh, post-positivist period. So they couldn't get rid of it. Even till today, metaphysics is there within natural sciences, believe it or not, is there within Darwinism, is there within uh, much of the questions that are being asked within natural sciences. It's not being eradicated. So this is another problem that the, the only empirical knowledge is valid and they, they, they have a set criteria like uh, known as verificationism that only allow into science those things that are verified and are verifiable. Uh, and this meant that only metaphysics, logic, mathematics was allowed into science and everything else became meaningless. Thirdly, arrogance, <coughs> not acknowledging limitations. So limitations in what sense? Now, the logical positivist movement would set criteria to rule out uh, uh, metaphysics and theology, they did not emphasize the limits of upper, our intellect. And we had problems before that, like the problem of induction. You take finite observations and you make generalizations. What if your finite observations missed on a very critical detail? Now, scientists make these finite observations and they, this is called induction. So they induce from finite observations generalizations. This is what scientists do. Uh, I mean, they combine inductor, induction and deduction within their methodology, but <coughs> primarily that's what they're doing. Now, that has problems because what if your fine observations do not meet the criteria? It's not a universal criteria. What if it's mistaken? So, for example, in, if European scientists go now and start looking for swans, and all swans in Europe are white, and they make an in, induction from that that all swans are white as a general rule. They take a flight and go to Australia and in the course of Australia they find a black swan. Their rules violated. So these are kind of problems of induction which is the limitation of our upper that they did not emphasize. So this led to arrogance. Fourthly, reductionism. Now this is a very important one because reductionism is uh, you know, uh, almost synonymous with materialism. So they reduce everything to physical phenomena. Now they're dealing with parts, which is material world, and missing the whole. So the Tawhidic universalism, the diagram I showed you, it's not reductionist approach. 
it's a holistic approach. It integrates the spiritual dimensions of mankind. It integrates the metaphysical dimensions. However, in modern science, uh, modern science without uh, fully empirically grounded justifications uh, does not accept metaphysical uh, realm. And therefore, they become reductionists. So they lack an integrating paradigm. And these are the solutions, and I'll finish on this in China. So they do not, act, the, 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 the Muslims, how do we <coughs> reframe the empirical science? We acknowledge wide but finite frontiers of knowledge, so there is no intrinsic rule which prevents scientists from discussing metaphysical uh, discourse. There is no intrinsic dualism in knowledge. Secondly, we accept that science, scientific laws exist which allow the universe to be habitually and rationally ordered such that we can predict the universe based on those uh, habitual laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the default sunnah of Allah. Thirdly, uh, Muslims study the physical phenomena by the tabdur ayat Allah, by contemplation upon Allah's uh, natural laws or causation laws, which might be more suitable here, as the basis of science. So scientific activity in the Muslim world appreciates Allah's Qudra. Fourthly, Muslims protect themselves from methodological biases to set rules for science that prevent scientists from asking the grand questions that are at the interface of science and religion. And lastly, and I conclude on this, that the Muslims, they appreciate Tawheed as an integrating paradigm, which is our methodological framework, which is common to all disciplines of knowledge, and which is what shows that between Islam and science, there should not be any uh, demarcation, there should not be any barrier, and we certainly do not accept a conflict thesis between religion and science. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanallah wa bihamdi, ka shaballah, ka shaballah, ka shaballah, ka shaballah, ka shaballah, ka shaballah, ka questions. So we've got about um, 10 minutes of questions that you can take them. So if you speak as loud as you can, if any of you have written down your questions, you can pass them around. Mufti Hilal will come around. And also, um, uh, uh, Sheikh Daniel. Um, if I can ask the speaker to repeat the question, just so that everyone else can hear it. Okay, so if you can raise your hand, double to the table. Is that okay? So we've got a question here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I found, uh, I'm finding some of what you said a bit abstract for me to understand. So, uh, you mentioned Tawhidic universalism and us nowadays being prohibited from addressing questions at the interface between uh, metaphysics and sort of religion and science uh, and the fact that Despite that fact, believe it or not, in natural sciences there are some metaphysics present, though maybe they're not explicitly uh, recognized or voiced. So could you maybe make that a bit clearer? Could you give some examples of what you mean uh, by that? Okay, so just for example, um, you, you'll be aware, like uh, Karl Popper. Who, Could you summarize that question for everyone else? Okay, the brothers asked for examples to the concepts that I've discussed today, and examples where natural sciences introduce metaphysical concepts. Is that the. <coughs> yes, uh, what we mean by uh, questions that lie at the interface of religion and science that we aren't allowed to question. We can't raise them now because of the current paradigm. So brothers ask questions that lie in the natural sciences which prevent us from raising religious questions. Now what I'll do is I'll just give one example where this kind of uh, questions are asked and if religion tries to ask similar questions then rules are put in place and those rules are not airtight rules. Those rules, they are very flimsy rules. Those rules do not reflect the history of philosophy of science. And I give that example would be the question of origin of life. Now in this field of study, which is known as the, uh, the abiogenesis, so from the chemical world to, the, uh, to life, 
we are asked science asks many questions, and when religions, religion tries to give an alternative explanation using similar paradigm as science, then rules are put in place to prevent religion from doing that, and those rules are relatively recent rules because in the history of scientific activity, those rules were never there. So, and, and I don't, I'm going to give this an example, but that doesn't mean that I adhere to this myself, like intelligent design uh, movement. Intelligent design is a Christian think tank, and they ask a similar question as what neo darwinists would be asking. But neo darwinists will <coughs> set rules and put those rules in place that inferential reasoning that intelligent design proponents will use will be prevented. So, if, so whose rules are we playing by? And what neo darwinists are doing is glancing into the metaphysics. So, origin of life, it, they're trying to explain it materialistically, but the, there are gaps in knowledge. And those gaps in knowledge are being filled with uh, 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 the, uh, there's been effort to fill those gaps with naturalistic explanations which don't exist in this time, uh, uh, at this very moment. So there are hypotheses, but well, those hypotheses are several. So why is religion prevented? Religion should be allowed to ask questions that are scientific, and Muslims who are scientists should be allowed to, allowed to engage in research that has bearing on that type of question. But there are rules that prevent us from doing that. So I hope that kind of, that's one of the examples where <coughs> that is like just saying, uh, and what they call God of the gaps. So they, yeah. so they, they insult that view and say, well, that's God of the gaps. And then maybe we say, and you're saying, well, you've got science of the gaps. But I'm saying that this is God of, this is endless gap of the God. Because this gap will always remain in if we're going to approach science through physical, uh, empirical means. Maybe science has to broaden its rules. And it did have a very broad rules a thousand years ago. Scientists, I mean, if you study Ibn al-Haytham, who's the pioneer of the scientific method in the 11th century, he's talking about religious discourse. And his philosophy of science doesn't exclude religion. And there is no like, clear demarcation and clear rules that this is the way scientists do science and this is the way religious people should be viewing these questions. That type of thing is, is a very modern phenomenon. So the God of the gaps, I would say that this is an endless gap if you're going to approach it through improvement. But if you're going to allow, uh, because I think what's happening is that we're, in the, we're, we're living at a time uh, where we've moved away from the Aristotelian science, we've moved away from Cartesian science, we've moved away from Newtonian science, and those sciences accepted dualism in nature. So physical world and metaphysical world were existed as two different domains of existence. We've now entered more around about 19th or 20th century in the age of materialism, where only material world is being is seen as reality, and this demarcation and this divide between material and uh, body, body, mind, and uh, material and non-material is frowned upon. But it may be that, and that's probably one of the reasons why Europe, Europe has sunk into this age of post-positivism because they can't give explanations. So what they've become is fallibilist. We don't have an answer, therefore we're going to keep the knowledge we have. But what we'll do is we will, uh, we, we will just make conjectures. And our conjectures are valid until proven otherwise. But the problem is you have a lot of certitude, you have a lot of certainty. And maybe the reason why you're not achieving that certainty is because you're not incorporating the other dimensions of life, which is the metaphysical dimensions. Okay, I have to interrupt you. Um, can, I, can I go with that? Okay. So I'm going to have to be um, a bit strict with our speaker. He's very passionate about this topic, so, that, so the answers are longer than I'm now going to allow. So um, what I'm going to say is I'm going to take this, right, and then um, and then you can answer them. 
Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Um, so we've got one question here. Uh, can neuroscientific explanations for consciousness, the self, be looked at within an integrated paradigm? Um, and is there anyone else that has a question at the moment? Okay. Uh, could you say your question? Yeah. Yeah, I want to know why, um, why should religion be involved in scientific affairs? Let's use the example of bio, biogenesis you said, right? Religion asking the certain questions won't reveal the scientific answer. It won't tell you what chemicals are involved, what molecules are involved. So why do you actually want religion interfering and asking these questions? Okay. okay. And yes, yeah. how do we take this discussion and actually bring it into everyday life to prevent what one of the issues I was mentioned was like the secularization of the Muslim mindset? Because much of this actually permeates everyday life discussions. If you even take the discussion about hijab and niqab, that's constantly in the media. When asked, you know, a Muslim woman answers why she covers and it's related to the belief in God, it's immediately rubbished as an unintellectual discussion because right. it's to do with something that cannot be proven. The premise is already set and it directs that discussion towards something that is unintellectual and doesn't need to be engaged with. So this discussion, even though we're having it at a higher level, it does permeate <coughs> so much of what's going on today and it's behind it is this sort of move to secularise, you know, this extreme atheism to take God out of the equation. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to bring, ask you to, you know, bring this to how everyday level, how do we sort of counteract this <coughs> within the Madaris schools community so we can actually be more proactive at challenging the mindset with our younger generation. Okay. <coughs> okay. Can neuroscience explanations of consciousness be looked at within an integrated paradigm? Yes, definitely. Because that's the field of study, I think, where body-mind uh, dualism can be appreciated. Because other fields of study don't really appreciate this body-mind dualism as much as uh, the field of neuroscience. So I, I would say yes to that. The question I was asking in front uh, was why should religion uh, ask the questions to do with the uh, origin of life. No, or, just, they're just scientific questions. Scientific questions. If you're looking for scientific answers, yeah. you're probably not going to get scientific answers if you're okay. asking the question. Right. So, it's a very good question. Uh, the question, uh, there's two ways to answer this. One is uh, in the Zami and the other is the uh, Rhetorical question and a, a question based on research. Now, I would ask the question, what is science? What demarcates science from non-science? Philosophers of science have been making this effort for more than 100 years with very little success. We've had Karl Popper give a criteria. We've had Thomas Korn give a criteria. We've had Henry Lakatos give a criteria. We've had Paul Feyerabend who talks about methodological pluralism. Anything goes attitude. So anything goes. There is, uh, and we'll move on, we've had uh, Larry Loudon who, told, who says the question of demarcating science and non-science is a pseudo problem because there is no demarcation between the two subjects. So when we are, so it's not to undermine the question, it's to say that why is science, we're coming from that way of thinking that science has exclusivity and hegemony over nature, physical nature, and religion should only be marginalized to uh, a, a, a metaphysical discourse. But my contention with that is that religion is not as Europeans have understood religion. Europeans have understood religion differently to how Muslims have experienced religion. Our worldview does not segregate between <coughs> church and state. Our worldview is a way of life. Eurocentric worldview there is a reason why he established that way. Because I'll give you one example only. <coughs> Giordano Bruno was burnt alive by the authorities. 1600 is the year for holding <coughs> on the view that holding to the view that uh, there is life on other planets. And guess what? Three, four hundred years before that, Fakhruddin al-Razi, rahimahullah, had written in his kitab known as Mufatih al that. There is a possibility that life exists on the other planets, extracting from Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. The word Alameen is used in plural, for, uh, and from that he extracts that there may actually be life. So Muslims were asking this question, but never persecuted and never put on house arrest. 
But Europe was having a different experience, and the transgression of scientists against the, the transgression of scientists against the authorities, the, uh, the, the religious authorities within Europe, been, has been imported into the Muslim epistemology, and now we view questions with that dualistic thinking. That why should religion ask the uh, physical uh, question regarding the physical world? So I would, uh, I would ask the question, why should this religion not ask the physical questions? Religion for Muslims is a way of life that includes both the physical domain as well as the spiritual domain. And you should ask questions on both ends of uh, the question rather than just be restricted to the spiritual domain. Does that make sense? Please feel free to ask subsequent questions. I, I don't mind if that doesn't make sense. I can, I can ask yeah. later. Please. Okay. We can ask at the end. That's fine. The sister uh, asked a question uh, about making awareness of the Tawhidic universalism. Now, I want to mention that Tawhidic universalism that I just uh, discussed today, it's not an abstract idea that I just invented according to a of presentation. This worldview, this way of thinking is already implemented, is the Muslim consensus, and it's the result of 1977 World Conference on Muslim Education, where over 300 Muslim scholars agreed that the reason why the Ummah is in this malaise and this deterioration of our uh, education system is because we've created Judaism in knowledge. We've created, we've segregated knowledge. But we need to recombine the knowledge into one epistemological framework. And what they then did, one government decided to take this on board, and that was the Malaysian government, and Malaysia implemented this Tawhidic universalism in the International uh, University of Malaysia, it's the International Islamic University of Malaysia. Now the courses offered by this university implement Tawhidic universalism. Now their MBBS doctors study Islamic ethics and Islamic metaphysics, and they, they have to take courses on Islamic principles, values, and attitudes when they are doing their uh, medical degrees. And natural sciences are not, it's an arbitrarily they are segregated <coughs> because that's a different domain of study to uh, physical sciences, uh, so theological sciences, but the demarcation is considered arbitrary only and not fixed. Um, we will have uh, more Q&A at the end of both lectures, so we can each one move on to, you know, can we have a round of uh, Masha Allah for uh, <laughs>